All right, I got to get back to work, but um, I'm going to try to finish book one, 20 through 23. That would be, I might not make it. We'll just see. I'll put it up either way. Walter Kaufman translation. I might be interjecting, my, I will be interjecting my own commentary. Beyond Good and Evil by Fadig Nutty, a prelude to a philosophy of the future. Okay. <coughs> Aphorism 20. Ah. Uh, all right. That individual philosophical concepts are not anything capricious or autonomously evolving, but grow up in connection and relationship with each other, that, however suddenly and arbitrarily they seem to appear in the history of thought, they nevertheless belong just as much to a system as all the members of the fauna of a continent, is betrayed in the end also by the fact that the most diverse philosophers keep filling in a definite fundamental scheme of possible philosophies. Got it? In other words, philosophical ideas evolve. There is no concept that's a thing in itself. A concept, a concept like cause and effect is really just one in a framework what Lakoff would call a framework of uh, ideas, you know, a, a complete metaphor. Cause and effect works with agency and works with all of these ideas that tie together, right? A lot like, you know, the greater mathematical system where there's various kinds of operations and, and the, that make up the fundamental system. And he's saying, you know, look how people recreate. You know, people recreate a brand new philosophy, and if you're astute, you can recognize stoicism in it or whatever. They recreate this fauna in the pattern that is evolved. Okay, under an invisible spell, they always revolve once more in the same orbit. Under independent, however independent of each other they may feel themselves with their critical systematic will, something within them leads them, something impels them in a definite order, one after the other, to wit the innate systematic structure and relationship of their concepts. Their thinking is, in fact, far less a discovery than a recognition, a remembering, a return and a homecoming to a remote, primordial, and inclusive household of the soul, out of which these, those concepts grow originally. Philosophizing is to this extent a kind of atavism of the highest order. Okay, so for example, Gary is quite recognizable as a Diogenes-style cynic. Right? There's modernization, but just like I'm a, a Pyrrhonistic type philosopher um, with modernization, taking you know, science and a lot of experiences into account, they didn't have 2,000 years ago. Okay. Uh oh, lost my place. Let's see, where was I? To wit, yeah. Their thinking is, in fact, far less a discovery than a recognition, a remembering, a return and a homecoming to a remote, primordial, and inclusive household of the soul, out of which those concepts grew originally. Philosophizing is, to this extent, a kind of atavism of the highest order. Okay. The strange family resemblance of all Indian, Greek, and German philosophizing is explained easily enough. Where there is affinity of language, it cannot fail owing to the common philosophy of grammar. See, this is what Lakoff is saying, is that our philosophy is stored in language. I got that idea from Nietzsche, and, well, I think I noticed it on my own, but definitely by the time I read Nietzsche, and then with Lakoff, there's a lot of research going into this, that, oh, it is, because of the metaphors and the way the meaning is embedded and involved in mapping from one domain to another. I mean, owing to the unconscious domination and guidance by similar grammatical functions, that everything is prepared at the outset for a similar development and sequence of philosophical systems. Just as the way seems barred against certain other possibilities of world interpretation, it is highly probable that the philosophers within the domain of the Ural Altaic languages, where the concept of the subject is least developed, Look otherwise into the world, and will be found on paths of thought different from those in the Indo-Germanic peoples and the Muslims. The spell of certain grammatical functions is ultimately all, also the spell of physiological valuations and racial conditions. So much by way of rejecting Locke's superficiality regarding the origin of ideas. 
Yeah, I'm not going to go into what, what that's all exactly about. But you should find it interesting. See, the thing is, we're talking 1866. A lot of philosophers we've been reading, we'd be reading at this time, would be talking about courage and why, where the honor of defending your king comes from, using God. So it, it's an interesting early opening and, and subjects that, that we actually talk about in ways we talk about with cultures that have proven to be relevant, which at that time people... Uh, thought they might be able to ignore and philosophize within Christendom, whereas Nietzsche uses a world historical context. Okay, aphorism 21. The causa sui is the best self-contradiction that has been conceived so far. It is a sort of rape and perversion of logic, the self-cause. But the extravagant pride of man has managed to entangle itself profoundly and frightfully with just this nonsense. Certainly it was invented to defend God, but then defended a priori truths and things like cause and effect with this bullshit reason, lovely tools like the idea of conservation of this or that or cause and effect and, and just justified with the biggest bullshit. The desire for freedom of the will in the superlative metaphysical sense, which still holds sway, unfortunately, in the minds of the half-educated, the desire to bear the entire and ultimate responsibility for one's actions oneself and to absolve God, the world, ancestors, chance, and society involves nothing less than to be precisely this causa sui and, with more than Munchausian audacity, to pull oneself up into existence by the hair out of the swamps of nothingness. Suppose someone were thus to see through the boorish simplicity of this celebrated concept of quote-unquote free will and put out it out of his head altogether. I beg of him to carry his quote-unquote enlightenment a step further and also to put out of his head the contrary of this monstrous concept of free will, I mean unfree will, which amounts to a misuse of cause and effect. thing is, Nietzsche believes in strong and weak wills, so will matters, that's what I've been arguing. But not free and unfree will, that's a very different thing. The idea of saying that you're not a result of all your ancestors is just trying to be a self-cause, cause a sui. You're trying to be God, basically. It's part of your desire to, to dominate your own drives. One should not wrongly reify cause and effect, as the natural scientists do, and who, whoever, like them, now naturalizes, quote-unquote, in his thinking. According to the prevailing mechanis, me mechanical doltishness, which makes the cause press and push until it effects its end, one should use cause and effect only as pure concepts, that is to say, as conventional fictions for the purpose of designation and communication, not for explanation. In the itself, in the in itself, there is nothing of causal connections, of necessity, or physiological non-freedom. There, the effect does not follow the cause. There is no rule of law. It is we alone who have devised cause sequence for each other: relativity, constraint, number, law, freedom, motive, and purpose. And when we project and mix this symbol world, the symbol world, the symbolic world into things as if it existed in itself, we act once more as we have always acted, mythologically. The unfree will is mythology. In real life, it is only a matter of strong and weak wills. It is almost always a symptom of what is lacking in himself when a thinker senses in every causal connection and psychological necessity something of constraint, need, compulsion to obey, pressure, and unfreedom. It is suspicious to have such feelings. The person betrays himself. Right now, just a while ago, he was talking about the illusion of the feeling of freedom. Now he's talking about the illusion of the feeling of unfreedom. Okay, that's a unique and important approach. At least, I think so. Right? Unfree and free will, both bad kind. Nothing's absolutely free, nothing's absolutely unfree. The feeling that you're free is just getting high on being a dominator. It's a bit ugly. But also thinking that everything is unfree is sort of getting low or kind of high on having to be obedient. He's saying, all I am is obedient to the laws of nature. All I am is the cause of the laws of nature. These two extremes both deserve criticism. In general, if I have observed correctly, the unfreedom of the will is regarded as a problem from two entirely opposite standpoints, but always in a profoundly personal manner. Some will not give up their responsibility, their belief in themselves, the personal right to their merits at any price. The vain races belong to this class. Others, on the contrary, 
do not wish to be answerable for anything or blamed for anything, and owing to an inward self-contempt seek to lay the blame for themselves somewhere else. The latter, when they write books, are in the habit today of taking the side of criminals. A sort of socialist pity is their most attractive disguise. And as a matter of fact, the fatalism of the weak-willed embellishes itself surprisingly when it can pose as la religion de la souffrance humaine, the religion of human suffering. That is its good taste. I'll, I'll just leave that as it is. Okay, I ain't injected enough there. Do you think? Probably need commentary. I think the stuff might be going by pretty fast. Okay, aphorism 22. Forgive me as an old philologist. Right? Philologist, lover of logic and words and reason, basically. Who cannot desist from the malice of putting his finger on bad modes of interpretation, but nature conforms to law, of which you physicists talk so proudly, hey, Bark Lord, as though why it exists only owing to your interpretation and bad philology. It is no matter of fact, no text, but rather only a naively humanitarian emendation and perversion of meaning with which you make abundant concessions to the democratic instincts of the modern soul. Everywhere equality before the law. Nature is no different in that respect, no better off than we are. A fine instance of ulterior motivation in which the plebeian antagonism to everything privileged and autocratic as well as the second and more refined atheism are disguised once more. So this is why Nietzsche gets in trouble because he's like, you know, hey, the law and nature is any, it's not equal. <clears throat> and even he, he, it sounds like, oh, the plebeians are antagonist to everything privileged. He must be insulting the plebeians. They have good reason to do that. Well, he plenty of time talks about their good reason to do it. It's their will to overcome as well. He doesn't begrudge, begrudge them that, I don't think. But anyway, it wouldn't matter if he did. Okay. Ni Dieu, ni Matre. Neither God nor master, and that is what you two want, and therefore cheers for the law of nature. Is it not so? But as said above, that is interpretation, not text. And somebody might come along who, with opposite intentions and modes of interpretation, could read out of the same nature and with regard to the same phenomena, rather the ty tyrannically inconsiderate and relentless enforcement of claims of power, an interpreter who would picture the unexceptional and unconditional aspects of all the will to power so vividly that almost every word, even the word tyranny itself, would eventually seem unsuitable or a weakening and attenuating metaphor being too human, but he might nevertheless end by asserting the same about this world as you do, namely that it is a necessity incalculable, of course not because laws obtain in it, but because they are absolutely lacking, and every power draws its ultimate consequence at every moment. Yeah. See, if the laws are absolutely lacking in the sense we understand laws, well, it doesn't mean there's not patterns and rules. So there's patterns to this lack of laws. He's saying it's better modeled as though there's no law and what there is is a power drawing its ultimate consequence at every moment. He gets in trouble because people think he's advocating that. No. He's saying that's the situation we're dealing with. You'll see. This is beyond that situation is what he's saying. That's the real text of this, I think. On the other hand, it doesn't redeem him. Dude like to praise, you know, Napoleon. He says outright his philosophy is, I'm of the age of war. I'm heralding its end. I'm preluding a philosophy of the future. You don't follow me because I'm part of that old age. You're the next age. But hey, look, I'm calling out these elements that are key. And they all happen to be things we talk about now, not the things that the philosophers of his day were talking about. So, take it as you will, but he's on the subject matter. He got it wrong to the degree he was stuck in his old age. Own age. Just like he says. I don't care what you think in general, except that I'm just telling you, I think that stands out. Okay. Uh... Supposing that this also is only interpretation, and you will be eager enough to make this objection, well, so much the better. You see, he offers a 
a, a challenging interpretation. He abandons it into an admission that there's more interpretations to come. Now, I don't know if Nietzsche wanted to have a domination of peaceful spirits. In a lot of ways, he rejects those kinds of ideals from time to time, or seems to. I tend to think that he, as an Epicurean, really did want that. But this was his ironic way, his absurd way. The world's absurd, you make an absurd message to, to, to present that. But it doesn't matter if I'm projecting in, because his mechanics of, of how the world works allows for me to apply my own value system and go, oh, yeah, my interpretation is just an interpretation, but I can make one that has different effective results, right? And I can admit that those are the reasons, and then we can judge my system based on those results and so on, and your system and our system that we obviously have to make together. All right, I think this is the last one in the book. Uh, you know, it's got many books in it, right? Book one, book two. Okay. So this is the end of book one. Okay. All psychology so far, aphorism 23, has got stuck in moral prejudices and fears. It has not dared to descend into the depths. To understand it is morphology, study of forms, and the doctrine of the development of the will to power, as I do, nobody has yet come close to doing this even in thought, insofar as it is permissible to recognize in what has been written so far a symptom of what has so far been kept silent. The power of moral prejudices has penetrated deeply into the most spiritual world, which would seem to be the coldest and most devoid of presuppositions, and has obviously operated in an injurious, inhibiting, blinding, and distorting manner. A proper phys physiopsychology -psycho has to contend, so physiopsychology is his way of talking about embodied mind, right? I found this concept of embodied mind later, and he's talking about the psychology of a physical creature. That's how he's analyzing things. He's ahead of his time on looking at, at us as evolved, you know, organic uh, mechanisms. Not mechanisms like gears and our machines, but mechanisms like nature creates with organic chemistry. A proper physiopsychology has to contend with unconscious, unconscious resistance to the heart of the investigator. It has the heart against it. Even a doctrine of reciprocal dependence of the good and the wicked drives, causes, as refined in morality, distress and aversion in the still hale and hearty conscience. Still more so, a doctrine of the derivation of all good impulses from wicked ones. That, that's where he gets at some interesting stuff there, because things come from their opposite, right? Like atheism wouldn't exist if nobody thought of gods. Nobody think of atheism as a thing. It's existing now as a reaction to Christianity. If it were to be a good thing, it would have taken its opposite to generate it. So good impulses come from wicked ones. Is a big. That's as common as that the psychology is made up of subpsychologies, right? Which usually is translated as souls. Okay, could be mind or whatever. If, however, a person should regard even the effects of hatred, envy, covetousness, and the lust to rule as conditions of life as factors which fundamentally and essentially must be present in the general economy of life, if, and must therefore be further enhanced in life, if life is to be further enhanced, he will suffer from such a view of things as from seasickness. And yet, even this hypothesis is far from being the strangest and most painful in this immense and almost new domain of dangerous insights. And there are, in fact, a hundred good reasons why everyone should keep away from it who can. Okay, so that seems harsh when you're talking about humans. If you're talking about nature and humans as part of nature, he's saying these truths then, you know, black widows by genetics even, betray their spouses if they can get away with it, eat it, and use it. These things, as horrible as they are, have been necessary in these other levels. And that's likely to make someone seasick. Why? Because someone here is just presumed to not really prefer a view of the world like that. People that notice the world as consumption and cannibalism don't want to see it that way. Maybe subconsciously you could say they want to, and maybe there's a psychological explanation. But they, the part that's saying this and believing that, they would rather see it another way. 
right? So maybe it's their psychology that led them to see it that way, and it doesn't mean that it's real. But regardless, there's an honesty in that. They don't want to see it that way. They're, they're being honest. They think they're being honest. Maybe they're just, uh, instead of honesty, they're allowing pessimism to rule, and that feels like honesty, or whatever you want to analyze it. But they don't want to see it that way. Okay, on the other, but you know, you want to face facts because especially if you want it to change, you have to accept how it is. On the other hand, if one has drifted there with one's bark, well, all right, let us clench our teeth, let us open our eyes and keep our hand firm on the helm. We sail right over morality, we crush, we destroy perhaps the remains of our own morality by daring to make our voyage there, but what matter are we? Never yet did a profounder world of insight reveal itself to daring travelers and adventurers, and the psychologist who thus makes a sacrifice is not the sacrificio del intelletto, the sacrifice of the intellect, on the contrary, will at least, will at least be entitled to demand in return that psychology shall be recognized again as the queen of sciences, for whose service and preparation the other sciences exist. For psychology is now again the path to the fundamental problems. So people find that really shocking. But if you notice, what he, all he really said there is here's the fundamental problems. And it's true, because we all want to pretend that, you know, we know thieving is wrong. Inside people know right and wrong. Well, why is there so many thieves? Why do people know? We understand a, a weird morality where it's like it's wrong to lie, but it's good for you. And he's saying, well, there's a value system of people that want to do things that are just good for them. We've never figured out that it's why to say it's not good for you to lie and there might be many cases where even though we might find some cases like that where it wouldn't be clear somebody might have saved their lives by lying maybe from people that just you know deserve to be lied to or maybe not and either way they've survived that other people didn't maybe it hinged on a lie facing those problems is is our big problem and and again I'm saying I think he does do this he does delve into where the solutions would have to lie. Now, are, can ones be made? You know, that's for us. He's not trying to answer that. He's from the age of war, you know. Um, all right, uh, part two is the, the free spirit. So we'll do that a little bit later. All right, cheers.